This is Canada Reads American Style, featuring two friends who love Canada Reads and Canadian literature. Welcome our host Rebecca from Michigan and Tara from Ontario. Hi everyone, it's Rebecca and Tara. And as you know, Tara introduced me to the Nora Watts series, the thriller series um, this past year. And I just blew through all of the books. They were so fantastic. And we are so excited to um, say that we have Sheena Kamal, author of the Nora Watts series, with us today. And she is the best selling, or her best selling debut, The Lost Ones, won her a Kobo Emerging Writer Prize, a Strand Critics Award and McCavity Award for Best First Novel. The sequel, It All Falls Down, has been called a stunning, emotionally resonant thriller in its Kirkus starred review. No Going Back and her first YA novel, Fight Like a Girl, were released in 2020. Now, as for the Nora Watts series, according to Sheena's website, The Lost Ones is a dark, compulsively readable, psychological suspense debut the first in a new series featuring the brilliant, fearless, chaotic, and deeply flawed Nora Watts. A character as heartbreakingly troubled, emotionally complex, and irresistibly compelling as Stieg Larson's Elizabeth Salander and Joe Nesbo's Harry Hole. Sheena, welcome to our podcast. Thank you very much. It is such a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to try not to fangirl too hard, and probably Tara as well, because we just Love your series. It is just absolutely brilliant. One of the best I've read. In fact, I just have to say this. I have two really top uh, mystery writers that I love, and you have cracked the top two. You are now in my, you're in my top three now, which is so exciting. Wow. Okay. So can I, who are the other ones? <laughs> well, I love, I love Sarah Paretsky, okay, yeah. who, who I've got to, gotten to meet a couple of times, and also Val McDermott. Those are my t t top two. Okay, I love those ladies too. They're so you are in great company with them. With them, I'm so honored. Great. Well, can you give us a little bit of your background because you have a really interesting and unique background? Well, so I um I came to oh gosh, how far back are we going? Because this can go on for <laughs> a long time. Um, but I'll, I guess I'll just start with writing. So I started um I started acting first, just out of college. And what I found that was that there weren't a lot of roles for somebody like me. And I I always kind of had a writing bug, but I just never I never thought it would go anywhere. It was just a skill that I had. Um, and I thought, well, you know what? Maybe I can try my hand at screenwriting. And so I did for a few years and I just felt like, you know, it, to make it as a screenwriter, it's really about connections and networking and I didn't know anybody. And so I felt like I was just beating my head against a wall, um, trying to get anywhere in that industry and that people weren't really seeing me. And so the next good idea that I had, instead of sort of going through, like going down the, the screenwriting path for it, I decided... I was going to quit my job <laughs> as a researcher for this uh, TV series that um, was set in Toronto. Um, I quit that job and I, I moved to Vancouver to write a novel and I didn't know how to do that. <laughs> like, I've never taken a writing class in my life, so I had no clue. I, but, you know, I just had this burning desire to prove to myself, um, maybe to the world, but mostly to myself that I could do this. And, um, and it was kind of a tough road, you know, I didn't have a, I didn't have a job there or a place or, you know, anything really just me, my mom, my little brother and my dog, we just got in the, um, got in the car, we drove, um, <laughs> across the country to, to have this adventure, I guess. And, um, and the lost ones was written fairly quickly within, within a year, I guess I had a, a draft of it and it was just long walks in Vancouver um, and like anywhere we could find to stay, we would do that. And so a lot of the locations that are part of the novel are places where I, I walked those roads and um, through those forests and by those waters. And so um, it was a, a labor of love and of passion. And, um, and then when I had the book, uh, a writer friend of mine said, why don't you go to, to Thriller Fest in New York to pitch it? Um, and we were talking earlier before we started recording about shooting your shot, right? Yeah. <laughs> so 
So I, you know, didn't know anything about publishing or, you know, I knew that you needed to have an agent, but I wasn't completely, like, I wasn't completely clear on the process of like what an agent, uh, you know, how agents spoke to publishers and the role of the editors. Like I didn't really know any of that stuff, but I was like, I'm going to go to New York and I'm going to pitch to agents because that's the next step on this journey. And as it turned out, I got an agent pretty much right away and the book sold. Um, so I, I went to New York summer 2015 and they sold by December. So it was this big whirlwind of a thing. And then I had to figure out how to write two more books, um, which I still did not know how to do, you know. So I think after I got the news of the book deal, I spent the – and in December, I spent the January just like curled up in bed. <laughs> <laughs> just being like, what, what did I get myself into? Like I have no idea how to do this. But yeah, it kind of worked out. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you obviously know how to write a book, Sheena. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know that. So, so, so when I, you know, when I talk to uh, writers or really just anybody about shooting your shot and taking chances on yourself, you know, it's a, it, maybe it's not a smart decision always because I've, I've done that before and failed. I've done that recently and failed as well. You know, there's, there's always a chance that you're just going to fall flat on your face and it's not going to work out. But there is a little chance that it might work out. Yeah. And also in the falling down on your face, you you learn how to get back up and you yeah. learn what you're made of and you learn what is what is possible in your world. And you never know until you try. Okay. I'm just kind of gobsmacked by that yeah, because me too. that just shows your innate talent. And because, all, well, we'll talk a little bit more later about how what I love about the books as well, but that is an amazing story, to be honest. <laughs> I don't think that many authors, first time authors can say that. I mean, that's just brilliant. Wow. Yeah. It also explains why uh, Vancouver almost seems like a character in itself. From mm -hmm. what you said that you spent so much time walking around the city as you're writing it, it comes through in the book. Like, well, Very I was cool. discovering it. I was discovering it as I was writing. And so, you know, when you live in a place, you kind of, you, things just get buried. And so you don't see things fresh um, as much. And maybe, you know, for some people, it's a good place to write from because they know a place instinctively. But for me, I didn't. I I was discovering. And so everything that delighted me or perplexed me, you know, it all went in there. And I, and I, and I, it is a character. The setting for me, you know, really informed the book. Yeah. Let's move straight into Nora. Because, but now after your story, I have a little inkling anyways, but I'm going to go ahead. So she is one of the most complex and unforgettable characters that I've ever met in books, Sheena. She, I, I love her. I admire her and she scares the poop out of me. <laughs> like I, I feel like I would be rightfully so very intimidated if I were to run into Nora on the street. Yeah, me too. You're not alone. I. I do feel like if she ever met me, <laughs> she would just be like, who the hell are you? <laughs> I don't know, though. I think you got a little bit of Nora in you, though. That's that's quite a story. <laughs> but what was your motivation or inspiration, I should say, for Nora? She came out of the story. So, yeah. really, you know, it was a truth that I didn't know how to write a novel. Um, and so it came about in the writing and what I started with was uh, a log line, which is something that you use in film and TV. So a log line is basically uh, a sentence that explains just, um, it gives a sense of a story, right? And so my okay. log line was something along the lines of a woman, I know it exactly because I pitched it, right? And that's how I got the agent. <laughs> this was a pitch that's in, ingrained now. Um, but it was a woman discovers the child she'd given up for adoption many years before has gone missing and now she's got to delve into her very dark past in order to figure out just what happened to this missing girl who is a child she's not sure she wanted to exist in the first place. Mm. And so with that, um, I'm not sure where it came from. I think it was just because I had, had been doing screenwriting. So I knew, I knew what a, a log line should have um, and I knew what a pitch should have. And it gives you a sense of story and it gives you a sense of 
character, right? Yeah. The character's journey. And so in the back of my mind, I knew what that journey was going to be. And so Nora just came out of the writing. I didn't do any character backstories. Um, I did do some research into um, culturally, because, you know, I'm not of the cultural background that Nora is. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure that I placed that um, in a sensitive manner. And I don't think that, you know, writing from the outside, you're ever going to get anything perfect. But if you're going to write outside of your own cultural experience or, you know, it's it's good to to have an idea of to, to ground yourself a little bit. So I did research on that as when I knew, you know, that was her, her background and just went with it and discovered her on the page and in the writing. So she was very fresh to me. Yeah. Okay. So with Nora, because she is who she is, uh, I wanted to know if you could read an excerpt that best describes her and then I want to ask, too, because I read that you had said this before, and I also went back and looked at some Goodreads reviews where I know. <laughs> I know some, well, only a couple people said that Nora was unlikable. Mm -hmm. And I wondered how that made you feel, because I think it's I feel the way Tara does. I love her like she is the most fierce female character in a series that I've ever personally read. Like, I mean, I love a lot of different other things or whatever, but Nora, I will never forget Nora. She will always be in my head, always. So anyway, so first I'm going to repeat, just to do an excerpt of who she is and also what do you think about this unlikable tag? Okay, so I'll talk about the tag first. Okay. Just because I'll forget. <laughs> right away. Um, but so that she's unlikable um, to me is, it's kind of funny just because who deep down is, you know, knows people enough to say that that person is likable or not likable. It's a vibe, right? Yeah. And, um, and that, you know, women are often, and the way that women are portrayed, um, mm. you, you, you want, there's something, you know, people want to like them. And, and for me, that's not important. What's important is that you see this character, this person, right? And so for me, like I said, she felt very real. And so it wasn't important to, you know, make her have um, lighthearted you know, moments that's going to make you fall in love. Like this isn't a, a rom-com. I'm not writing, <laughs> but, you know, I don't write in that space. And I read a lot in that space, but I don't write in that space. And it's just because I, I think that the story demanded some darkness, a lot of vulnerability, and there was just something about her knowing that she was a, a singer really helped me understand and see her because I I was an actor. I know a lot of artists, uh, actors and, and singers and stuff. And these are people who you see their soul in their art. And I think it's really difficult to know an artist as a human being without taking taking into consideration what comes what what parts of them come through through their art forms and so for me that people didn't like her like that's just it didn't sometimes it's funny <laughs> but but you know it wasn't important that she be liked it was it was important that she be seen and and that also understood that she is someone who lets her soul open through this art form through singing and that's how you, you know, that's a window into her soul. And so that made sense to me that she would be a bit opaque um, and misunderstood and, you know, on, on the outset. Okay. I love your answer about her not needing to be likable. Thank you so much for that, because I agree about as women, we're expected to always have that kind of that persona that we're supposed to be likable. So brilliant answer. Love it. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I feel like I like, I feel almost giddy. You guys are really nice to talk to. <laughs> um, after this, I'm gonna have to go back to my life where like we're just like normal, and people are like, "You're the worst." Uh, you can just call us up weekly, Sheila, yep. and we yep, can do yep, this yep. once a week, and just <laughs> yeah, and then you can go might, back into your life. I might just don't be surprised. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to read a, what I normally read from this book, which is just the first chapter, because I think it gives us a good sense of the story, but also um, Nora. 
And it's the it's the first thing that I wrote in this book. So it really was the thing that was the um, the cornerstone of of her character and her story was just this first passage. So so yes, chapter one. The call comes in just after five in the morning. I'm immediately on guard because everyone knows that nothing good ever happens this early. Not with a phone call, anyway. You never get word that a wealthy relative has passed and is leaving you his inheritance before 9 a.m. It's fortunate, then, that I'm already awake and on my second cup of coffee, so I'm at least moderately prepared. I've just come back from my walk where I leaned over the edge of the seawall and contemplated water that is calm and gray, just like the city itself at this time of year. As usual, I tried to see the warm, dark current that flows from Japan and turns into the North Pacific, tempering the cold and spreading its tepid fingers to the coastline. And, as usual, it refused me the pleasure. Vancouver. Some people say it's beautiful here, but they've never idled in the spaces that I call home. They've never been down to Hastings Street, filled with its needles and junkies. They've never considered the gray sky and the gray water for months on end as rain pours down in an unsuccessful attempt at cleansing. Then comes summer, and it's so hot that you can roast marshmallows on the fires that burn through the forests in the province. Summer right on the coast is nice enough, but still several months away when my phone rings. I stare at the unfamiliar number on my call display and, after a moment of hesitation, decline to take it. Several seconds later, it rings again. I'm intrigued. I answer, if only because I've always admired persistence in a caller. Hello? There's a long pause after the person on the other end explains in a hoarse voice why he's calling. The pause becomes awkward. I can tell the caller is fighting himself, wanting to say more, but knowing this is a bad idea. No one wants to talk to a rambler over the phone, especially one you've never met before. I imagine the caller sweating on the other end. Maybe his hands have gone clammy. The phone slips from his grasp and I hear it clatter on the ground. He swears for a full 30 seconds after he struggles to pick it back up and regain his composure. You still there? Did you hear what I said? He asks. Yeah, I heard, I say when the silence has become excruciating. I'll be there. Then I hang up. I've never heard the name Everett Walsh before, but according to him, I may know something about a missing girl. He does not tell me what, though. I consider not meeting him, but he sounds desperate. And if there's one thing that draws me more than persistence, it's desperation. Even though finding people is part of what I do for a living, what would I possibly know about a missing girl to warrant a call at this hour? His desperation is so fresh and raw, I can almost taste it. Oh, that's, Oof, wow. yeah, that yep. sets it up so well, yep. Nora. Wow. Or Nora. See, I'm calling you Nora. <laughs> That's okay. I I named um I named one of my kittens Nora. Actually, my brother did, um, and so I, I like the name. Yeah, no, it's a great name, and I just got swept up in the moment. That was really awesome. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Okay, so another character in the book. I, I actually I really love all of the main characters in the book, but this one is Nora's companion, Whisper who is her dog, her dog companion. Um, it seems like a bit of a cliche, but I think it's true for these two in that Nora rescues Whisper, but at the same time, Whisper also rescues Nora. Yeah. Can you discuss their relationship? Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. so the truth is, is that it is a cliche, but I didn't know that because I just thought <laughs> I was doing so, so it just came, you know, came across, you know, came about, not across, but came about as um, just a natural sort of thing because somebody as, I'm a dog person, well, I'm an animal person, I'm a cat yeah. person now, which I didn't know, but um, yeah, like I've, um, I've had um, pet, you know, companions, animal companions um, since I was a little girl and I just know that sometimes the hardest, the people who seem so so difficult um, on the outside to human beings who have trouble socializing with other people, they give their hearts to animals. And yeah. it really did seem like that was her journey and she didn't want one. You know, she found a stray um, who, who adopted her, I think. Mm -hmm. And in their relationship, you really see her vulnerability and her heart. Because I think it goes back to that likability thing. You know, 
like I said, it wasn't important that she's likable, but there, there had to have been something that shows, shows that human, open, vulnerable heart side. And so it isn't there in the music, and it's also there in her relationship with Whisper, who keeps her keeps her on her toes, but also keeps her connected. Yeah. They are like a, a strange reflection of each other at times, too. Yeah. Because I find sometimes Whisper would be a little distant mm-hmm. from Nora, and she would accept that. She was like, okay, he needs his time away. And it was just, it's a really beautiful relationship that they had yeah it's my honestly it's my favorite relationship to write um i i well there's also uh trisha and columbus in fight like a girl i love to write them yeah but um but really i've been with nora and whisper longer and it is a complicated relationship but you know if you you know relationships with your with your animal companions they that it can be complicated and it can be heartbreaking and and also some of the more important relationships in your life, right? Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask a question that is ob- a little obvious now hearing your full background, but um what I wanted to ask is the pacing of the series is reminiscent of TV or movies and was that intentional? And then the other question I have is also you carried one overarching story across the three novels versus having separate standalone stories or standalone novels. And I wondered if you will keep that style going forward. And this is our big way of saying, when will we get another Nora Roberts, <laughs> Nora, Nora Watts book? <laughs> I think you can find a lot of Nora Roberts. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like that actually might be um, an easier bet because this time there are no more Nora Watts books. Oh, um, and that's just a publishing thing. So you know, if I yeah. get contract to write another one, I will happily do it. Um, it's just it hasn't been in the cards, and that was pretty heartbreaking. Yeah. Uh, I'll be honest, just because I think I could write her for the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, my writing life anyway. And so it's hard. It was hard to, because I didn't know when I wrote no going back that it was going to be the last one. I didn't know that. I, I suspected that potentially my, because publishing is, is a brutal industry and Mm -hmm. you really, you know, I could write and self publish, but it just wouldn't be the same. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, I wanted to give in the three, just because I, I had, I'd grown up on series, so the Born series and stuff like that. And so I knew that it was, for me, like just with the story, my mind just kind of went there to the, the three overarching. When I wrote the first one, I actually had no idea that there were going to be two others. But as I moved from the second to the third, um, it did make sense to have this overarching something, something. Um, and... Um, and I love that it's serialized, but serialized in the publishing landscape only works if you do have one of those series like, um, like we were talking about Louise Penny, whom who is I adore. Um, there's there are a few other ones, um, the Bosch series and stuff. You know, so it's they've got to have that kind of audience to to continue if you're going to be serialized, right? Mm-hmm. Standalones. Just if, as we're, you know, taking it away from just a love of reading and just, you know, book, you know, getting into publishing talk, standalones um, are just where the market's at now. Wow. Well, I have a question, though, because I've heard this from other Canadian authors about who've written series that I love. And then they talk about, you know, th- that it's kind of ending or it has to end because there's no one else to pick that up. And my question is... Is it easier in the United States with U.S. publishers than it is with Canadian publishers, do you think? No, I think it depends on the readership. So, mm-hmm. for example, Louise Penny again, you know, she's Canadian. Her books are mm-hmm. Canadian. Um, and that series I can see continuing on for a really long time, which is great. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, but it's not – It you can't plan on your series being picked up for the long term, right? So you just sort of – Every book has to be, um, you, ha- I didn't know this either, but you <laughs> think like, okay, this might be my last shot at, at, at this character. Gosh, well, 
I'm well, I'm I'm sorry to hear that. But will there be do you anticipate that there will be maybe not Nora Watts, but other books in your future as well? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I'm always writing. It just um, I never really set out to be a novelist. It just sort of happened. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And uh, specifically a crime writer. But I do. That's the space I'm generally in. Um, you know, like I said, as as much as I like writing or reading in different genres, this is the genre that I, I tend, like my mind just sort of works better in, um, and sort of comes across more clearly on the page, I think. Um, so there are other books in the works. We'll see how it goes. Um, Good. yeah. So yeah, it's just, I think that there are some, potentially some other characters and avenues I'd like to try my hand at. Well, that's good news. Yeah, that's intriguing too. Yeah. Okay, so you have also published a a YA novel, Sheena, so Fight Like a Girl, Mm -hmm. in which the protagonist, Trisha, channels her violent impulses in uh, Thai kickboxing. Can you discuss her relationship with uh, kickboxing and also tell us about your own relationship with kickboxing? Sure, my pleasure. Yeah. So I always, whenever I talk about this book, I always say that it was like a fever dream and that's true. Like I was, um, I was away, I was in Rome and I was writing, I was supposed to be working on No Going Back, which is a third Nora book. Um, and then all of a sudden this character just sort of burst out of my imagination, just like Nora had at the first, yeah. actually. And she was just like, like this uh, kickboxer, um, this Muay Thai practitioner, teenager, um, who just, she was like, she grabbed me and she was like, I've got a story to tell you. You better listen. And um, and within a week, I had a like a bare bones draft of the thing. Wow. And about six weeks after I filled out that, that novel. Um, but Trisha was just such an urgent and powerful force in my life. And I think the reason the book came about so quickly, I didn't have time to second guess anything. Everything that was on the page in terms of the cultural background was something, you know, things that were informed by my own uh, cultural heritage. And then when it came to Muay Thai, I'd been training Muay Thai at that um, at that point for maybe 10 years, like okay. maybe slightly less than 10 years. Um, my best friend from high school owns a Muay Thai gym and was a Muay Thai fighter. And he is just, you know, whenever I go to the, and I, you know, whenever I'm in Toronto, I go to that gym and it's where I live. It's like my um, second, I won't even say second home because sometimes it is the first <laughs> home. You know, like it's, it's the place, it's one of the places in the world where I feel most comfortable, most myself. And so I spent hours and hours and hours just training and sometimes not even training. Sometimes just sitting there and just shooting the shit with the other, yeah. with the other you know, fighters. Um, and, um, and sometimes, you know, my friend Mikey would let me work there. So sometimes I, I would just like sit around and write there. So it, my relationship with Muay Thai is, is one of, it, it's, it's a sport that I love to train and I love to practice. I don't train consistently ever, but it has been a part of my life for so long that so much of, about the sport and the personalities involved are just so deeply ingrained in my imagination and my psyche. And I just had to, I just pulled from it. Right. And, and it was something that happened really, really naturally. Um, so yeah, so that's what it is. But I love, yeah. I love um, combat sports. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I do actually. Um, there's just something about the the journey of a fighter that seems um, that parallels the journey of a writer, which seems crazy. Like when you yeah. first hear it. But I, you know, I was in Thailand and I did two months in Thailand at a training camp there, and I found that there was a lot of similarities in the fact that you need tons of discipline. Um, there potentially is no money. <laughs> you're, you're, you know, but it's, it's this passion that you follow and you follow and you follow because it's what's in your heart. And that's what I feel about writing. So maybe not all writers potentially feel this way. We'll, we'll feel this connection with fighters, um, but I certainly do. <laughs> um, and also it's an incredible release. Yeah. So for me, when you're when you're training, you can't be thinking about other things. You can't be in your head. And for me, 
um, when it comes to writing, that's the big drawback is that I'm always in my head. And it's really hard to to actually be in my body and being in your body is a really important part of processing and letting your imagination roam, right? To turn off that logical brain and just kind of be, right? Yeah. And for me, that's where inspiration comes from. So that intense physical activity really helps me um, sit, sit in my body better and and access my imagination better. I love the image of you writing in a kickboxing gym. <laughs> Most people picture, I think, writers in like a cafe with like the background music. And I love the idea that you've written in a gym. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's definitely that gym too. Actually, I'm training now in Montreal at a different gym. I haven't been in, in quite a while, but, <laughs> but I say I train there. Um, but yeah, but it's, I find it to be really inspiring for some reason, you know, and, and the personalities are funny to me and cool and just so interesting. And so they're like, I think more writers should write in gyms. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you so much for chatting with us today. And your writing, I mean, it's, I know it's not effortless, but your talent, and I think is just a part of who you are. I mean, you discovered this amazing talent and I, you know, we love the Nora, Nora Watts series. I have yet to read uh, fight like a girl, but I'm going to re be reading that one next. And I'm just so excited that you'll continue to write because you have an amazing ability to, I think you pick up a, one of your books and you start reading it and you can't put it down. And I can't, and I am a slow reader and I can't say that about all authors, but man, I couldn't put it down. I, I finished all of your books in really record time for me, but I loved every last minute of it. I loved, I mean, there wasn't a down moment in any of it it was just so so beautifully written so th I know I'm gushing but anyway I just think you're fabulous <laughs> thank you thank you so much you really made my day <laughs> really. um they no, I really appreciate that and and it's it's very nice to hear thank you all right well thank you so much we really appreciate it and when you get the next book published we'd love to have you come back because we guarantee we'll be reading it 100% okay. <laughs> well thank you this has been a pleasure to speak with you guys Thank you. Thank you for joining us on our bookish journey. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing Canada Reads American Style wherever you listen. You can connect with the podcast and Rebecca on Instagram at Canada Reads American Style and with Tara at On a Branch Reads. Until next time, keep reading.